so much, Declan. I um I think I'm with Elijah sometimes. Um I do think that seven 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 ninety three eleven is one of Prince's best songs. And um I've thought about that a lot over my lifetime. Like, um, why did Prince give one of his greatest songs to the time? Which I think is just shows how generous he is as a human being. Um, but also, we'll get the, get into this later when we do the time roundtable. I sometimes think that, and I know that some people are gonna like maybe. Um, drive a stake through my heart that Morris Day delivers on certain songs better than Prince does. And I think 779311 is one of those um, instances. And I shouldn't be talking about, like 779311 is like a dear song to me. I think it's also not only one of Prince's best songs, I think it's one of Prince's best recorded guitar solos on record. I also think it is one of the best keyboard solos on record. So, also when we talk about the LM1, the first song that I think about is 777-9311 and the programming involved in that. So, it is actually one of um, Prince's most important pieces of work. Yes, so loved your presentation, Declan. Thank you so much. Download your presentation. I'm so sorry. I I looked for it this morning, but I can't see because you sent it to me. Yeah. My apologies. Oh, okay. I was like, I thought I saw it. Let me set you up. Y'all doing all right this morning? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. This is pretty quick. All of my purple life, right? Yeah. <laughs> All of my purple life. Okay. Let me treasure you back in my heart. Should be good. And then you can just use the arrow keys if that's okay. Yes. All right. So I struggled a little bit this year because I'm usually the journalism PR marketing guy, which I'm still in that same space. But the more I listened and the more I thought about it, having three projects at one time, I wondered, how did you market this stuff? Like, what really did it take to really make this ship really move the way that it moved? So this morning, hit and run, how the times, what time is it disrupted Prince's brand strategy? Okay. I'm going to have church this morning. <laughs> all right, so y'all can hear me all right? Okay, so one of the first things I want us to think about is Prince as a brand strategist. So some, a couple of things just to think about. What do we think about when we think about brand strategies? How a brand builds identification and favorability within its potential customers or the already pre-existing customer that they already have. And it takes a few ingredients to make this thing work. Perception, voice, storytelling, brand identity, the vibe and core values of Prince as an artist, as a musician, but also as this band leader, but as this curator. So, of course, you know, different goals had to be met, different deliverables had to come, but then figuring out what sort of elements are essential to the success of his brand, but also the success of the other groups. First, we present ourselves with a problem. Five albums in, not many top 10 singles on the pop side, MTV is this new medium that's coming, but also two other side projects coming. So the biggest thing, the dilemma was Prince wanted to be a crossover artist from the very beginning. So we have to figure out what sort of ways can we make this work. But then also, too, we have this big machine, which is Warner Brothers behind him. So how are you going to figure out what the label's process looks like versus what your process looks like and his frequency? Because also, too, one of the things that we also have to remember is this is probably the first moment in Prince's career where his existing problems with the record company really started. And a large part of this was because Prince was just super creative. He was super in his bag. And so when you get to a point where you're constantly writing and producing, now you're at a point where two, three singles into the album rollouts, you got another album you want to throw out. 
But that disrupts the flow of the music business because the labels just didn't run that way. So now we have to figure out a really interesting way to, one, still carry through with this marketing plan that we have for this particular project, but then also, two, be really smart and sort of buck the system just a little bit so that he can still put out music, so he can still have his voice out, but then also, too, kind of control his market share within the music business at large, but also just in the artist community. And the solution to the problem is what? Create other vehicles for his sound, for his image, and for his writing. Dope photo in the background. It was never uncommon in the record labels for the executives to play music for a lot of the other acts. Now keep in mind, Prince was signed to Warner. So Warner had Devo, Warner had Al Jarreau, Warner had Christopher Cross, Warner had Shaka Khan. And so it was also really, really dope that some of the executives would play. Bob Kras now, who's the co-founder of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but was also one of the executives at Warner at the time, who was responsible for signing Devo, the same year Prince was signed in 1977. An article in title, on title in 2018, by um, Gerald Casal, who was the guitar player, remembers actually Bob Crass now pointing to a poster and declaring, this guy is so freaky, we don't know what to do with him. The guys in the mailroom think he's gonna be big. <laughs> so you can already start to see, you know, five albums in, they were really on the verge of letting him go because there were no hits other than I want to be your lover, and a few modest R&B singles. So now it was at a point where we have to really figure out something new. This gentleman that you see on the slide is a gentleman by, by the name of Bob Merlis, who was the senior VP of Worldwide Communications at Warner Brothers during the time the Triple Threat Tour and the whole album rollouts were coming. We jumped on the phone this week for about 30 minutes, and he literally just kind of dropped some, sci some science. And one of the things that he mentioned, he kind of walked me through what that process usually looks like for an album to come. And keep in mind, this is pre-TikTok, this is pre-Twitter, this is pre-YouTube. So now you can literally drop a project instantly and the fanfare usually hits. You can drop a single on TikTok and those little bars or a couple of scales in, that's going to be your hit. But in this particular moment, you know, album rollouts took maybe three, four, five months before the albums were set to come out. So usually the artist was assigned a publicist. The album release schedule was usually a month in advance because of the manufacturing process to print and press the projects. But then also, too, they also looked at the market and looked at previous discussions about what previously happened with controversy and with Dirty Minds. So there was definitely some interest there, but it was really sort of figuring out how to make it make sense now because the sound was a little bit different. Each album was different. So naturally, now you have to figure out how to plan and support the tour, figuring out radio, and figuring out what songs are we going to release from this project to really make this shit move. And when Prince was signed in 77, he came with his own press kit. And that was rare. It was frowned upon in the publicity departments a lot of times because figuring out a good story to sort of craft around the projects so that now there's interest in the public along with the music. But then also, too, you know, right around this time, once 1999 started to drop and started to build his momentum, somehow Lil Red Corvette just took off on pop radio. So they had a little bit more momentum to work with. But then also, too, the music video was this new medium. And they were mostly made for international markets because there weren't many outlets stateside that were really amplifying and promoting these. I think about a specific article that good sister Carol Cooper wrote for the Village Voice called 1980 to 1989, how 80s music bent the color line. One of the things that she made it a point to say in her piece was residual bigotry found its clearest expression in the emerging music video industry. But MTV never warmed to traditional R&B. When the channel finally began to program videos featuring black performers, it was because white listeners were requesting rap. Meanwhile, alternative outlets like Video Music Box and black entertainment television had arisen to support black product. So this was really a moment where now this was really starting to happen because of course Billie Jean comes and you know what happened, but then Prince comes and right around that same time, here it is. But also too, once it came to the tour, it was usually the promoters in those markets that relied on the media and they had those relationships. 
And depending on what market it was, usually the communications departments would usually do that same thing. But they usually left it up to the promoter because they had a little more of a knowledge about what was going on. But Prince wanted complete control over every part of what it was he was putting out, which was a conflict because that was these guys' responsibility. But of course, they had to sort of budge and not really ruffle any feathers because this was the goose that was about to lay the golden eggs. And so they knew that this was going on. So, but the interesting thing, too, about when what time is it was coming, there was a whole different character that was created that they could sell. You know, he was super fly, he was funny, he was cocky, but that translated to ticket sales, that translated to record sales, that translated to visibility on television, but also Prince wasn't doing a whole lot of interviews during that moment. And even when he was signed, there wasn't a whole lot of story by him because he was a kid. You know, what do you do at 17 years old? You going to your local soda shop to get a milkshake, you playing basketball with your friends, but as a 17 year old, he was mastering instruments, you know, doing his thing. But ultimately, it was really trying to figure out what story can you tell at this point to make this thing move. Another interview that was done on Sirius XM Channel 127 in 2016, Bob Merlis made it a point to say on Make It Plain, Prince was so incredibly prolific. He literally got ahead of himself. He certainly got ahead of the record company's ability to effectively market his music as it was coming out. He was impatient. I understand an artist wants his work to be acknowledged, appreciated, and consumed. The problem was there were constraints of the marketplace. And so now, we're going to get to this rollout, which we just went through. But also, too, sorry about that, now we get to the deliverables here. Just a little record of kind of what sort of came of it once you got to the tour, once the videos came. But this was also the moment where the purple became the signature color. This was also the moment where the definitive or the basis for the Minneapolis sound was coined in this moment. The whole funk pop concoction, many of the best 80 songs would try to literally come after it in Prince's Wake to make the same sort of like acoustics, but then also two record labels were catching on to it also. And they knew that once these things were coming and the sound started becoming a little bit more ubiquitous, now everybody has to have this because this is what people were listening to. But also too, one of the things that was interesting about his brand identity, and I look at the staging, what Leroy Bennett created as the Nike check or the Starbucks logo. Think about it. The two main videos that you saw, 1999, the Little Red Corvette had that same Venetian blind setup, had the pole also, but also one of the things that was different because that was the exact same staging that you saw for the controversy tour. So there was always this sort of mental picture in your brain of what that looks like, but what's different now? The smoke, the mirrors underneath all the blinds to bounce all the lighting off of it. And what was beautiful about that was that was Prince's way of creating more of a provocative view for the viewer. It was very emotional and very abstract. And what Leroy Bennett was responsible for doing was really carrying out this sort of idea and making it really concrete. So one of the things that he made very clear in one of his interviews was the basis of what we were doing was creating this very sensual, sexual world of intrigue. All right. He also said we offered a tantalizing peekaboo glimpse of Prince's fast evolving live show. And so what was beautiful about all of this was how perfect it was. But even once you start to see the sets really start to come to life and the shows start to come to life, anytime you see Prince do things like this or do things like this or do things like this, those were cues for Bennett to move the lights to rotate the stage and he was really sort of mastering the show the whole time he was cueing his band to do certain things but more importantly it was for you to pay close attention to how the sets transition and how the lighting was sort of moving around so why are you thinking he's dancing and why he's moving around and entertaining the mess out of you he's running the show that's right. That's which again that's that brand recognition that's that brand but however now we're getting to a point where when you see these albums come together and then you start to see the show come together, what did we say yesterday? The time beat them down. 
That wasn't part, that was not a part of this brand. That wasn't a part of the brand, but then also too, you know, the band rehearsed like crazy. They were already on stage with Vanity Six by the time they went on stage, so that was the warm-up drill. That was the warm-up drill. And so one of the things that Jimmy Jam made it a point to say on Quest Love's podcast, Quest Love Supreme, I don't know if you all listen to it, but it's amazing. He talked a lot about how they barely had a budget, and a lot of times all the clothes that you saw were thrift store suits. And so they knew something was different right around that time because they would go to certain markets to play. They got to try to go to a thrift store to get clothes, and guess what? Thrift stores ain't got no clothes. But why is that? Because once you start seeing Mars Day on Soul Train and American Bandstand, and then you go to that market and you see them with them suits, guess what? Now everybody wants to dress like them. But, but guess what? When the women showed up to the show to see Vanity Six, the women looked like Vanity Six. And then by the time you get to the MTV situation, you see the purple coats, you see the trousers, and you see all the women and all the men in the band looking similar to Prince. Guess what? Now everybody wants to dress like Prince. So it was amazing, but the whole idea was to really sort of create this sort of image of respect, this image of class, this image of how brothers looked in the neighborhoods where they grew up. So the suits that you saw and what they were wearing were really sort of emulating what black excellence looks like which was also in the back of Prince's mind because Prince knew he was destined for crossover appeal. But a way for him to keep that grip on that black audience was to have these brothers still funking it up. The problem was Prince wrote all the music and expected them to just listen to a cassette and play. But the problem was, and this is where the disruption comes in, the band could write, they could play their tail off, and they could outperform him in many respects in some of these markets. So the disruption really came in that moment because everyone, and so when you ask the question, what time is it? It was also kind of a little play on words because it was time for everybody to start figuring out their next move. And that was also in the moment where you start to see Jimmy and Terry starting to produce. And a large part of why you recognize them with those fedoras and those suits, according to Jimmy, according to Jimmy Jam on that interview, they ain't had no clothes. So they just dug into the bag that they had with all the suits. And that's what they were wearing when they would go to their sessions and that became their brand. All right. And even Jesse, you know, one of the things that Jesse pointed out on the same podcast, he said there were no rules to how Prince did anything. He had a little bit of a theory, but it was all guttural and instinct. He was smart IQ wise, but I learned how to make records. I came up with the choreography. I came up with the arrangements on stage. Prince was known for putting shit on the Time albums and leaving me, Morris, and Terry to beef with MFs that we ain't have, well, that we ain't have S to do with. So when someone asked the question yesterday about we don't like New Wave and what that meant, that was actually, according to Jesse's perspective, that was a knock on Andre Simone because somehow Prince had this idea of what was going on outside of his orbit when people were doing certain things, but he was using the band in many cases as more of a passive aggressive sort of situation to project how he felt about certain people. And in Jesse's case, he was like, we ain't got nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> now I gotta go box with MS and I ain't got nothing to do with that S on record. But the beautiful thing was too, you know, the makeup, the rouge, the eyeliner, all that stuff, that was his way of sort of getting visibility and also getting people to stare at him. And Jesse was one of those guys that was fearless and just would just do it. Also the pink suits, same thing. It wasn't until these brothers met James Brown because everybody thought they was queer wearing those colors. It was James Brown that told them when people start calling you that, you're doing something right. <laughs> all right? But by the clothes of 82 going into 83, of course 1999 was literally on everyone's critics picks list, especially after the tour. Bob Krishgal, who's one of the godfather of music journalism, he also wrote a 1982 Paz and Job column that says, starting in November, however, seven of my favorite 1982 albums 
everyone a variation of a theme restored a lot of my fire. Prince's 1999 made it a pretty damn good year after all. But where the disruption actually came, again, during this moment, was the fact that these guys were sharp. They came with their own musical identities. Didn't get a chance to do it on this particular go around, but once they hit that stage, it was a wrap. So in closing, before we move forward, and I'm ready to take questions and to really dialogue with y'all, I just wanna leave y'all with the fact that disruption actually came because these guys knew what time it was. They knew they were ready to move forward. They knew they had their own sounds. They knew they had their own look. But it was also a moment where this guy right here made it possible for that push to really happen. But then also, too, we wouldn't know the, the global superstar that we know right now without this period, without this tour, and without this dream in purple. Thank you. Quick, quick caveat, sorry about this, but the jacket I was gonna wear <laughs> was a bomber jacket with the What Time Is It album sleeve on the back. Oh. With Morris Day's signature on the sleeves, but the delivery man didn't show up in time. <laughs> so y'all will get to see this next year for sure. Yeah.